You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. You've had a long day at work, and you can't wait to just get home, take off your shoes, plop yourself down in your favorite chair, and relax. Ah. You walk up to your tranquil residential home and your neatly manicured lawn in your quiet suburban neighborhood, put the key in the lock, open the door, and... Yes, the pets have gone wild! What were you thinking? Welcome to the show about everything you always wanted to know about exotic pets. Where to get them, what to feed them, and how to care for them. You'll even find out why some people live with a monkey. Now, here's your host, exotic pet expert and author, Bob Tart. Hey, Bob, what were you thinking? Hi, I'm Bob Tart, author of the books Enslaved by Ducks and Fall Weather, And as always, I'm doing this show from West Michigan. I live in a little town called Lowell, but I grew up a few miles from Lowell. Now I got my directions mixed up. Let's see, west of Lowell in Grand Rapids. And uh, my guest today also grew up in Grand Rapids, and it is Janessa Kite. She went to Forest Hills Northern High School, and then she received her bachelor's degree in pre-veterinary medicine. Veered away from vet school, and got a master's degree in biodiversity conservation from the University of London. Janessa has been with the Zoological Society of San Diego for eight years, working at the San Diego Zoo's Wild Animal Park as a senior bird keeper, specializing in all different breeds of birds. So welcome to the show, Janessa. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I appreciate your coming on. You sent me an email about um, one of my books. I did. And then you happened to mention about your really interesting job, and I thought, well, boy, that is just a natural because we've got a few birds in our house. And <laughs> One or two. Yeah, not that many, not <laughs> that many. And uh, we do have several outside, but they're, you know, fairly commonplace. But I was thinking it's so cool with someone who works at a zoo because you get to spend your day with all kinds of exotic birds, but then when you come home, you, you just have two parakeets at home, right? Correct. Okay, well, we'll have to talk about how that happened. <laughs> but, um, you know, in a way, it's sort of a dream job, I would think, because you get to interact with birds all day, and then you don't have, at least at home, you don't have a, a lot of the cleanup. So how many species of birds or, you know, how many individual birds do you care for at the, at the park? At the last count, I had 111 individual birds, and I think it was 39 species, if I remember correctly. I'm not positive on that, though. Could you describe the environment that the birds are in a little bit? Um, Well, I live in Escondido, California, which is very far inland from the ocean. It's very hot during the summer. In fact, um, during June this year, we had highs of around 117 degrees. Good grief. Yeah, and all of the pens that I have my birds in, uh, the area that I work in is off exhibit. And all the pens are outdoors, and uh, they have some shade structures and everything and a lot of plantings and trees and so on to keep the birds healthy and happy. Okay, but you say, could you explain what you mean when you say they're off exhibit? Off exhibit means the public has no access to them. And it's actually 75% of our collection is off exhibit. What the people can see, the public, when they, when they come in, the patrons, all they see is about 25% of the birds that we actually have. What I work with is strictly breeding birds, and that's not what the public gets to see. Gotcha, gotcha, because they would disturb the birds too much. Correct. Yeah. Where are the birds that the public sees? What Are, are they in cages, or how, how does that work? There are, Some are in cages. Uh, well, I guess I, you can say they're all in cages, but um, some of them are in walk-through aviaries, where you actually walk through the aviary, and they're flying all around you, and they can land on you if they want to, and... The keepers will go in and feed them, and people can walk right up to the keepers and talk to them and, and interact with the birds. It's really nice. Yeah, I've been to a couple zoos like that, and it just has it, you know, head and shoulders above the zoos where you're just standing outside a cage peering in. Uh, right. You know, I just love it. I think it very few cages. Yeah, I, I think it was the National Aviary in um, Pittsburgh that Linda and I went to a few years ago, and we, we were sitting at a, on a bench inside the aviary and a, a curacao walked up to me and um, started just pecking the heck out of my leg and I thought you know, I thought that was really cool I, I really like that kind of interaction with the That's birds. That's exactly how it is. 
Yeah. Do you have to stick to birds that can deal with those climate changes, or do they maybe go indoors or something when it gets too hot? How does that work? Um, well, for the birds that I work with, we actually have temperature-regulated misters. So when the temperatures reach 93 degrees, the misters come on for our birds and also sprinklers. Birds can get into the misters if they want to. And then, like I said, they also have shade that yeah. they can get out of the sun if they'd like to. But most of the birds, 90% of the birds that I have are African, so they're used to the hotter temperatures. Um, the thing we, we worry about with some of the smaller birds is actually the cold temperatures we'll have overnight in the winter, which will get down into the mid-30s. I know that's not cold for you. But no, that's cold, <laughs> though. That, that is cold, and I would think birds would have a problem with that. Yeah, we have heat lamps for them, though, for that. Boy, that's a crazy temperature fluctuation. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. There's something about the geography doing that, or what is it? I honestly don't know. I mean, we have uh, Santa Ana winds that will come in during, like, this time of year is big for Santa Ana winds, which are really, really warm winds that will come through the valley during the day. And then overnight, it also brings in the cold temperatures. Yeah. Wow. What are some of the birds that you work with? I have everything from um, storks and cranes to small uh, birds called birds of paradise. And I have hornbills. I, I have a lot of different species, probably a lot that um, a lot of people haven't heard about because they're pretty exotic. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned, oh, what the, oh, the hammer cops. Is, yeah. is that South African? Yes, they are. I think I've seen a picture of that before. Um, yeah, they actually, their their head looks like the anvil part of the hammer. Yeah, yeah. And those are pretty small birds that make a very large nest? Yes. they're In, in the wild, their nest can reach over 100 pounds because they just keep adding to it. And, um, in fact, the hammercops I have right now, they just keep adding to their nest, I mean, constantly, and it's never good enough. They, <laughs> they have never actually laid eggs in it, but they just keep adding to the nest. And I, I just don't think the real estate's proper for them as far as oh. they're concerned. So what, does the nest keep getting larger or higher, or, or what are they, they doing? They keep building on top. Some oh, hammer cops will build out. These guys happen to be building upwards. It's like a chimney, too. Usually the, the doors on the side of the nest, they keep building it like a chimney, so the door's on the top, and it's just not working out well for them at all. And there's another bird that happens to be in that exhibit called a storm stork that thinks that they're actually building him a great nest because he keeps perching. Oh, on wow. So, so that's not helping. So is part of your job description creating ideal environment or conditions for the birds to breed? It is. That's exactly what it is, um, especially for me, since that's what I deal with is breeding 24-7, basically, is uh, trying to find the perfect nesting material and making the condition just right so the birds want to breed and making sure they're healthy and happy enough that, you know, they're not having any kind of anxieties if they're not going to want to breed. So do you have any idea what to do with the hammer cops to make them happier with their nesting? This pair has, has always had <laughs> issues with their, with their nests. Um, I have another pair that never has problems. They have chicks and lay eggs. In fact, this year they um, they didn't have any chicks, actually, but they laid a lot of eggs this year that were fertile. They just didn't hatch, unfortunately. But it just happens to be this certain pair, and, and in fact, we don't even know if they're... They haven't laid any eggs, and if they would, we don't know if they'd be fertile because we actually haven't seen any breeding from them. Are hammer cops monogamous, <laughs> or, or can you switch them out? We can. Well, they're monogamous. However, um, the Zoological Society, as is all the American Zoological Association zoos in the U.S., they're all run by what's called an SSP. It's a species survival plan. And they actually tell us which pairs we need to put together, which birds, which females, which males have to be paired because of representation. We don't want, obviously, um, any chicks coming from the same pair and only the same pair because we'll have too many of the same, you know, chicks from the same pair and we can't make more babies. Okay, now that's really interesting. I didn't realize that, you know, zoos aren't <laughs> just kind of looking after their own interests, that yeah. you're actually looking after, is it the national population of these birds? Yes, yeah, and, and worldwide, too. Oh, worldwide? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we do a lot of interaction, have a lot of transactions with zoos overseas also. Now, these aren't particularly rare. Are they the hammer cops? Not particularly, no. I mean, the uh, we actually base what we do as far as eggs and breeding at the park, and most zoos do this, based on the species survival plan as far as how endangered the species are. For instance, the hammer cops are allowed to keep their own eggs if they lay eggs. We also have um, 
some birds that as soon as they mm-hmm. lay their eggs, we pull their eggs and give them fake eggs instead. Right. So we raise them ourselves. That way we can have better control mm-hmm. of the, the hatching and the environment and raising of the chick. Yeah, uh, that reminds me of what, I guess, the way a lot of people who are in, like, parrot breeding for the money. Right. You know, they they will do the same thing because they exactly. think, yeah, they can be, have a more, a higher survival rate, I guess. Exactly. Now, I'm guessing that uh, your job as senior bird keeper was not your first job with the zoo. Is that right? Or did you walk right into that position? Um, actually, when I've, I've worked at a few other zoos, and I originally... Um, had no intention on working with birds, believe it or not. I showed horses professionally for 14 years, and that's what I had intended on on doing for the rest of my life. And um, then when I finally retired from that, um, I decided to start volunteering at a zoo back in Colorado where my family now lives. And I ended up getting a job with them, and when they hired me, I was supposed to be working with their large hoofstock, like their, their giraffes and rhinos and that kind of thing. And I got there on my first day of work, and they're like, oh, but by the way, you're not going to be working with hoofstock. You're going to be working with birds and reptiles instead. Oh. Yeah, exactly. That's not exactly what I said, but <laughs> I was like, okay. So within two weeks, though, I knew birds were my passion, and I've been doing it ever since, and that was over 10 years ago. So. Can you tell me what you think it was that really attracted you about birds? There's so many things. I mean, it's just obviously their beauty is one thing, but... The way they nest, the way they sing, I mean, there's just so many things. Their personalities, there's so much to learn as far as birds that people have no idea about. I mean, even people that specialize in birds, there's still so much to learn. So it's just an intriguing part of my job that I find every day. You know, I'll tell you one thing that I love about pet birds is that you kind of expect that a mammal will become close to you, like like a cat or a dog. But it was a real revelation to me that you can have a really tight bond with a bird. Yes, exactly. And that they're really, really keyed into you with this kind of laser-like intensity, and they are very affectionate. Definitely. And they bond to you more than cats do for most of the time. Mm-hmm. I think they're probably as bonded to me as my cat is. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder sometimes why it is that um, birds are more popular as, as pets than they are. Why they aren't? Yeah, um, I think people just think they're more intimidating than, than they really are, especially, you know, parrots live so long and people know, are starting to realize mm-hmm. and know that they live as long as they do, so they don't want that kind of responsibility with parrots anyway. And then parakeets, I think people just don't understand, and they're like, oh, a bird's not that big a deal, I want something that's going to get really affectionate, and I don't think birds are affectionate. Yeah, people are always surprised when I tell them that every one of our birds has a distinctive personality. Absolutely. And uh, they don't get it, but, um, <laughs> you know, y- even our hens, I notice that a, lo- a lot of them, I can really pick out from just how they're acting, even if they're, you know, the same breed, and I normally, you know, w- wouldn't be able to tell them apart visually. Exactly. So it's very cool. We have some um, white pecan ducks. We have far too many. We have four. To me, that's far too many. And there's one named Bumpkin, and I can't really tell her from looking at her because she looks so much like the others but as soon as I come in the barn with treats I know I know which one is bumpkin because she will jump straight up in the air you know you are wanting them yeah my Uh, best friend has um, a chicken that is probably her best stress reducer because she says if she comes home from a bad day of work all she has to do is go outside sit down and May the chicken will come and sit in her lap and just sit there and fall asleep in her lap and she can pet her forever. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you get from the zoo in Colorado to your job in San Diego? Um, Well, I moved to a couple other zoos down in Florida from Colorado and then went back to Colorado and I wanted to be back where it was warm. I missed Florida really bad as far as the, the weather. And I was looking for a different job in a different location and actually ended up going to work for the society, but in Hawaii, and um, working with endangered Hawaiian birds over there. Oh, are you and kidding me? I No, it was wonderful, I, and I probably would still be there, but it was impossible to make a living there because the facilities are run on grant money instead of regular society money. So it was just next to impossible, and um, so I ended up transferring from Hawaii to San Diego because it was just an obvious transfer. So Now, how long ago was that, if I might ask? I've been in San Diego now for... Five of the eight years. Oh, okay. Because the, the reason I was so surprised what you said about Hawaii is that um, 
a good friend of mine in this area. Her name is April Anderson. Mm -hmm. She worked briefly in Hawaii with uh, endangered birds. It oh, could, really? It could have been the same facility. Probably. Yeah, that's really cool. I wouldn't cool. doubt that at all. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a short break, and then I'm going to talk to Janessa a little bit more about what her day is like at the zoo and personalities of some of the birds that she works with. So we will be right back. What Were You Thinking? We'll be right back after Bob gets the ducks out of his living room. Don't go away. Do you love your dog? Then you'll love feeding him mouth-watering, all-natural treats, lovingly handmade by a professional caterer who wanted the very best for her dogs. Make no mistake about it, these are not ordinary dog treats. These are doggy delights, like breakfast banana biscotti, honey bear peanut butter balls, yummy apple cinnamon mini cakes, and so much more. Your dog will howl in delight. And now you can get a scrumptious sample pack by going to dingersdogtreats.com. It's a $25 value, yours for just $9.95 through this special radio offer. That's D-I-N-G-E-R-S, dingersdogtreats.com. Every one of these gourmet doggy treats is handmade from the finest ingredients and taste tested on our own dogs. Your dog will love them. Get $25 worth of doggy delights now for just $9.95. Go to dingersdogtreats.com now. That's D-I-N-G-E-R-S, dingersdogtreats.com. Yum. <laughs> Human? What planet am I on? Welcome to Pet Planet. Here's a copy of Pet Planet Magazine, Florida's most informative and fun pet resource magazine. It features heartwarming stories and informative articles from local and national pet experts. Excellent. Pet Planet Magazine offers Operation Planet Rescue, helping rescued pets find new homes. And it's available at 500 locations in South and Central Florida and 24-7 on the Internet at PetPlanetMagazine.com. If you're out and about with your pet, you may be featured in Paparazzi, Candid Pictures of You and Your Pet. For up-to-date pet-friendly events, activities, and pet-related services and products, Pet Planet Magazine is your final destination. I shall take this magazine home with me. Back to your home planet? No. To my condo in Boca. Pet Planet Magazine. Check them out at www.petplanetmagazine.com or 352-394-8578. It's out of this world. Here's the story of a lovely lady who is bringing up three very lovely gulls. Join us every week on Wings and Things and get a bird's eye view of everything there is to know about pet birds and how to make your frequent flyer a happy camper. Wings and Things. That's the way we became the Birdie Bunch. Only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, ducks are in the pond, rabbits in his hutch, and monkeys... Oh, in my car! Oh, okay, well, I go check my insurance policy. We'll turn you back over to Bob. Hi, I'm Bob Tard, and we're back with What Were You Thinking? And I'm speaking with Janessa Kite, and she is the senior bird keeper at the San Diego Zoo's Wild Animal Park. And I just realized you have a bird last name. I do, <laughs> Actually, they say that my background is French and English, and supposedly the way people got their last names was because of their profession. So we either figured we were kite makers or we did something with birds. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. I guess a kite is a type of raptor, is, is that right? Yes. And do you have any of those? That, no, you wouldn't have those at the zoo, or is that a worldwide species? No, it's not. It's, it's mostly North American, so we don't have any of those. What is your day like at, I keep saying the zoo, is it fair to call the Wild Animal Park a zoo? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's part of the, the Zoological Society and they're very, very similar. Um, the only difference is it's just laid out differently. We're, we're laid out more like a safari, whereas the zoo is like any zoo that you would expect to walk into. Yeah, and it's a fabulous zoo. I, I was there many, many years ago and I did not get to go to the Wild Animal Park. But um, Next time you're in California, you'll have to visit. Oh, I would love to. Mm -hmm. What is your day like, a typical day? Well, uh, we start at 6 o'clock in the morning, so that usually means I'm up at 5. And um, the first thing we do is have our morning meeting with all the employees in the bird department, and then we go from there um, and 
start right away feeding our, our birds. And feeding for me, because I have so many, takes from about 6.30 core to 7 to about 10 o'clock in the morning. Do you have to do the food preparation or is the food already prepared for you? No, we have a department. Um, our our uh, forage department actually makes all of our diets for us. Because that good because we just would never have time. No, that uh, because that would just be a tremendous undertaking. Very, very large. I mean, they spend a whole day making the next day's diet as it is. Just that department. Yeah. So it's yeah. Luckily, we don't have to do that. But that takes us till lunchtime. Our lunch is at ten o'clock, and then um, I'm usually back out at work t- at about eleven thirty ish, and. The rest of the day is consists of cleaning pens or doing maintenance like pruning trees and other horticulture work or cleaning pools. It's mainly the rest of the day is spent out in the sun cleaning. And then we also do, like during breeding season, which obviously, like most, is during spring, uh, we'll do, be doing a lot of nesting stuff and uh, working with chicks and eggs and that kind of thing. Right now it's starting to slow down. So, What are some of your favorite birds to work with? Oh, there's so many, and I think it changes every single day. But um, I would say, honestly, waterfowl are one of my favorite birds. I love geese and ducks. Um, I have some crazy ones that I work with, but I love them anyway. And then I also have these birds called secretary birds. Oh, yeah. They're African birds, and um, they have really, really long legs. They almost look like they're um, a part of a hawk and then part crane because they have really long legs and then a hawk-type body very big birds too they weigh probably about mm, 20 pounds yeah you can kind of see the sea dinosaurs in them a little bit can't you yes definitely and uh, they kill their prey by stomping on it and little did I know that when I first started working here that you know how aggressive they really were because I had never worked with them before and I made the mistake of going into a pen one day with the most aggressive secretary bird that we had and went to feed and all I had to protect myself was one of those the plastic saucers you put under a plant oh. <laughs> and I, I kind of held it up in front of my head because I'm like oh this will protect me and I walked out and I mentioned it later to some people I worked with and they're like you realize he can kick right through that oh dear like, oh, really I do now so. so what do you do now when you go in that pen he and I have actually had some therapy and we've we get along well now <laughs> okay and, yeah we've worked it all out so. you, you think it was just because you were new and he wasn't used to you and he was kind of defending his territory I think so I mean he's he's got a female in with him and then one other little little ibis type bird and and uh, I think it was just mainly because that's that's his pen and he's got a lot of area but he he's just uh, he's a good boy now I don't have any problems with him now but if I go into his pen without I usually wear a visor and sunglasses and if I don't have my visor and sunglasses on then he'll be aggressive towards me oh okay why why don't you explain that (laughs) I I don't understand I'm assuming it's because he recognizes me in a certain way oh okay my visor and sunglasses on and if he doesn't see that it's not the same person to him oh that's really interesting right and I that's what I'm assuming I that's the only thing that I can figure out from that whole thing good grief (laughs) Hmm. And you you deal with parrots, too, don't you? I do. I have, I have a few parrots. We don't have a lot of parrots in our collection, but I do have a few. And I have a, I have a hyacinth macaw and then two other parrots, another parrot called Pesquet's parrots. Oh. And they actually look like vultures. They have little black vulturine-type heads and then a red body. Okay, and hyacinth macaws would not be African. No, they're not. It just... He actually happens to be part of a pair that we had. The female actually died a few years ago, so we just still have him, and we're we're waiting to get another female to be able to breed him with. Okay, I I never heard of this other kind of parrot you're talking about. Right, they're called pesque parrots, but um, and we are trying to breed them, but they're still a young pair as far as the age of the bird, and uh, they just started coming into season and becoming hormonal. Yeah. I guess these haven't made it into the pet trade at all, huh? No, not at all. What have you noticed different about parrots that are kept at the zoo than, you know, the same species of parrot that people might keep as pets? Uh, I don't know if you've been able to, you know... Well, I think the difference is is at the zoo, when, when we're breeding birds at the zoo, we try to keep the attention down to a minimum because the more imprinted birds are on the keepers, the less likely they are to breed, and the harder it is to have them breed because they just don't act the same. They don't have the same instincts. So in the the pet trade, the pet birds are always more affectionate than the zoo birds. Sure. 
Sure, but but at the same time, probably your birds really enjoy their independence. Oh, definitely, absolutely. In fact, uh, my male pescade, when I go to feed him in the morning, I have to hold a net in front of my face, otherwise he launches himself onto my head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh out, out of friendliness or out of aggression? Nope, we haven't figured that out yet because he, he'll land on my head and hold on. To, I have long hair, so he'll hold on to my hair for dear life, but he won't try to bite me. So we haven't decided if he's, he's just doing it for attention or if he's doing it because he really is looking for a good way to get to me. Oh, how do you get him off when he does that? Usually I call for help. Yeah. I have, we carry radios with us, and I usually have to call somebody because I can't get his little feet unclenched oh. in my hair. <laughs> now, do you have African grays there, or are those too commonplace? No, we don't. That's uh, We don't generally work with most uh, parrots. We only have the two species that I mentioned, and we also have green wing macaws and one Moluccan cockatoo, and that's it. And what kind of waterfowl do you have? Oh, we have all kinds. We have all, um, obviously the mallards that live here year-round. And then we also, in the collection, we have swan geese. We have poachers and, gosh, I don't know if I can remember all of them, Coscarilla swans. I'm trying to remember, poachers, they have a North American amalgam, don't they? Or, or, they not, do. or a, they a, do. a counterpart, I mean. Yes. <laughs> do we remember what they are, what the name is? Um, not off the top. They're a type of poacher. I mean, they, they're called poachers, but I'm not sure... If they're like just North American poachers, or exactly what the species name? Yeah, I know that's not a North American name. I'll have to look it up in in my duck book. <laughs> but um, w- what do you like about the waterfowl? I don't know. I just I, I've always been intrigued by them. And um, I mean, even when I was in college, I used to go to the lake that was just down the street from college and and sit there and feed the geese and everything. That was just a soothing and calming experience for me. So I think I still hold that in high regard because that's how I feel about them. I love how emotional they are. Oh, absolutely. They're so, yeah, very much so. <laughs> I like they it. certainly show you when they're not happy either. Yeah, yeah. I, I like it with uh, our geese that when I go out, they, you know, immediately start honking and they just <laughs> get really crazy and they just, I don't know if it's so much greeting me or if, if I'm disrupting <laughs> their social order or what it is, but um, right. uh, I like it that you can talk to them and they'll make sounds back and they're a real interactive kind of bird. Right. I have a, a Hawaiian goose called a nene, and he's mm-hmm. got some, some issues, <laughs> some anger management issues, and any time someone walks past his pen, he charges the, the pen. Oh, he and does. If you walk in there, he ima- immediately comes over and grabs onto whatever he can on your ankle and just starts whacking you and everything, and it's like, it, we, we can't figure out what happened to him, but we treat him like gold, too. Yeah. You... And, and then he's in with a couple of swan geese, and uh, the swan geese keep him in line when I go in there. You know, she's feeding us. Be nice to her. Now, are those the same as the African brown geese, the they swan geese? They are very similar. Okay, so that's probably what we have with uh, Liza and Haley. Yes, I think that, in fact, that they look exactly like Liza and Haley. Okay. In the pictures of them, they look exactly like that. Okay, yeah, we still have them. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah. Some of the animals in my books, of course, many of them have passed on, but right. um, we still have Howard the Dove, who's 18. Oh, my gosh. Yep, and, and Liza and Haley. And they're, they're, yeah, they look just like Liza and Haley. Oh, yeah, they're, they're great. And I tell you, I, I don't think I'd want to be attacked by a nene <laughs> because <laughs> um, I've had a Muscovy come after me before, and it's, it's none it's very t- similar. <laughs> yeah, do you have Muscovies? They're probably too commonplace. No, we, I, I worked with them down in Florida, but I, we don't have them at, in uh here at the park. There's feral populations of Muscovies in Florida, aren't there? Yes. Yeah, I, I like them. I, I think they're very cool. Yeah, they are. I used to have them right outside my apartment down in Florida. Yeah. Now, I have to tell you, it interests me that you work with all these birds, so you have certainly have been bitten by the bird bug, <laughs> but at home, <laughs> your uh, aviary is pretty modest. It is. It is, mainly because I live in a small apartment, so I don't have room for the bigger thing. I keep it small for a reason. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, but you have a couple parakeets, and why don't you, you had one for quite a while and just got a new one? The first one I have, I've had her for about three years, and it's kind of an interesting story how I got her, because uh, someone had actually smuggled her into the park and released her into one of those walk-through aviaries. Oh, dear. Like we weren't going to recognize that she was a parakeet amongst all these exotic birds. Or maybe they didn't care. Maybe they just wanted to get rid of it. Yeah, and I mean, there's just so many different... I mean, you could, they could have taken it to the Humane Society or, you know, or put it in the, in the want ads, but they decided to smuggle it into That's the That's terrible. Park. But um, we ended up... Ca- she was e- easy to catch, obviously, because she was a pet bird. 
And uh, we had to put her in quarantine for 30 days to make sure she didn't have anything that she had given to our birds. And then with the people in the bird department, we had put our names in, anybody who was interested in having her, put her names in a hat, and my name happened to be drawn. So <laughs> that's how I ended up with her. And she's still, she's very timid. I mean, she doesn't like to come out of her cage. Um, the couple occasions that she has come out, she actually has come to the front door of her cage and knocked on it. Like, she wanted me to open the door. And, mm-hmm. But she very, very rarely ever does that. Oh. Yeah. And That's really interesting. Being in her cage. Do you suppose she was sort of traumatized by being loose? I think so. Um, and there, she was in an area, there were so many other birds that were probably chasing her and everything. And she was there overnight because we found her very early the next morning before the park opened. Oh, good grief. So, yeah, so I'm sure she was quite traumatized by it. But I, I keep working with her, hoping we're going to get through it. But And what's her name? Moa. It's M-O-A. It's uh, actually Hawaiian for chicken. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> and uh, how is she doing with her new friend? She's doing really well. I, haven't, I don't have them in the same cage yet. I have them in cages next to each other so they could get used to each other before I introduce them. But she's, she actually is, when I first put her next to each other, the cages next to each other, she sat on the very opposite end of her cage away from the new bird and uh, yeah. then like snuck down to the other the end closest to them and hid behind a mirror that she has in her cage and just stuck her face around the, the edge of the mirror like looking at it. It was very cute. <laughs> yeah, I was laughing quite a bit about that. I have uh, rarely found two parakeets that won't get along. I, th- I think we... And that's what I think. They're very social birds. Mm-hmm. I just am, I'm cautious. Yeah, yeah. Well, believe it or not, we've pretty much run out the half hour. Wow. Yeah, and I had a lot of questions I still wanted to ask. So, um, you know, maybe in a couple months or so, we'll do it again if you're interested. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much, Janessa. Thank I you, really Bob. appreciate talking to you, and I'll talk to you again. Okay, okay thank bye-bye. you. Okay, bye-bye. Well, that's about it for this episode of What Were You Thinking? Thanks so much to Janessa Kite for being my guest. If you'd like to be a guest and talk about your exotic pet, just email me at bob at petliferadio.com. That's bob at petliferadio.com. A thanks to everyone who has made my book, Enslaved by Ducks, the number one best-selling bird book on Amazon.com this past week. I appreciate that, and if you haven't read my book, check it out, and also check out the sequel, Fall Weather. Thanks to everybody, and thanks to our very mysterious producers who are producing this week's show, Inside of a Giant Jack-O-Lantern. Bye-bye. Thinking about buying a monkey? How about a ferret or a skunk? Then check out the show that will answer the burning questions, where do you get them? What do you feed them? How do you take care of them? And most of all, what were you thinking? With exotic pet expert and author Bob Tart, every week on demand from PetLifeRadio.com.